so thank you again. Um, touching on uh, the Patriot Awards, we did uh, nominate Captain Gist for his service in relation to the Patriot Award. Uh, sometimes they give those awards to uh, patrol officers or detectives or um, jailers or whoever they you know they come across. Uh, I nominated uh, Captain Gist because I know the efforts he's put in in the tw uh, uh, the eight years he's been here. He came to work here on uh, no, um, I'm sorry, September the sixteenth of I'm sorry, let, November the sixth of two thousand and twelve. So he's been here almost eight years. It's coming up on his anniversary date. And uh, I want to read, if, if you could just indulge me, uh, uh, the, um, the posting that I gave the uh, chamber when I nominated him for the award. This is what I read uh, when he received his award that day. Um, I read this. The Clear Lake Shores Police Department and Chief Tracy Keel are proud to recognize Captain Phil Gist as their recipient of the League City Regional Chamber Patriot Award for Outstanding Law Enforcement Efforts. Captain Gist has served with the Clear Lake Shores Police Department since November the 6th, 2012. He has always been recognized for his dedication to the profession and his attention to detail. Captain Gist, when not administering the needs of the police officers under his supervision, maintains catalogs and secures all evidence and property taken in by the agency. He was given a, an identification and evidence system that was broken and largely non-existent. He has since revamped and redesigned it into a viable and commendable process. This tedious and time-consuming assignment is more than one person should be able to handle. However, his poise and level of dedication has created a system which can be counted among the best that we have in this profession. Captain Gist is married to his wife, Karen, has three children of his own, as well as three stepchildren. He is a 36-year veteran in law enforcement, holds a Master Peace Officer Certificate. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Law Enforcement from Sam Houston State University and a Master's Degree in Psychology from University of Houston. Uh, please join me in congratulating Captain Phil Gist as the Clear Lake Shores nominee and recipient of the League City Regional Chamber 2020 Patriot Award. That's a whole lot to say, but uh, what I'm what I'm saying is, uh, uh, Captain Gist is is the example that by which we should all follow, and uh, I thank him for his service. He uh, he puts us on the map, and and I can't uh, I can't tell him how much I appreciate him enough. Um, that being said, uh, j just as a little side note, he was my first FTO back in uh, back in the day. So uh, a lot of that gray hair on his head is because of me. Uh, so, uh, so uh, congratulations, Captain Guest. Uh, we appreciate your service. Yeah, thank you, Chief Keel, and thank you, uh, Captain Guest, for all your service. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Having no questions, we'll move to Building Official Kevin Harrell. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Uh, I'll give my building report for September 16th till October 7th. Uh, I issued 19 new permits uh, since our last meeting. 18 of those permits are minor construction. I do have a new permit at 819 Cedar. The house was ongoing, but the general contractor uh, discontinued his permit and a new contractor was hired for that address. I'm got 303 Oak is a new construction. The framing is, is ongoing. I should be doing a rough in inspection very soon. 727 Pine, the framing is started. I approved the concrete slab pour earlier this week. 620 Marina Bay is a new hair salon. I issued an occupancy cert, 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 yeah, certificate, pardon me last week, uh, so it is open for business. Oakey's Yard House, the contractor is starting to work inside and he's installing some new exterior doors, also working on reconfiguring the beer cooler inside and the restaurant inside. 903 Juniper, uh, the contractor started the exterior framing, electrical, plumbing, and mechanical rough ends. 
I did inspect those a week and a half ago. Uh, they're looking good so far. Uh, Aspens, I'm sure you've noticed a new staircase and walkway. Uh, currently, the owner is getting quotes for the handrails and guardrails. I have noted that to the owner that that is an unsafe condition and he needs to uh, uh, tape that off. Schaefer's Grill. Uh, Schaefer's Grill was flooded during Hurricane Beta. Got about an inch and a half water in it. The restaurant did go and do remediation to the downstairs, to damaged walls, the, the kitchen, and also the downstairs bar was rebuilt. I did inspect all those last week and they are back open for business. The second story bar is still under construction and I completed a rough in inspection of the plumbing and electrical last week. In code enforcement, I have three code enforcement cases going right now. Two are overgrown yards. Uh, one is an unsafe structure that uh, I inspected the property inside and out, and I am working on a report of my findings, and I'll be presenting it to city council probably next month. Uh, waterfront leases, I currently have one case of an authorized use of an outdoor grill, uh, but that's all I have if anyone has any questions. All right, having no questions for Kevin Errol. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. uh, Gima Clear Lake Shores, Volunteer Fire Department, Chief Rob Steckler, I don't think he's online. Kurt. Yes. I have a quick question. My name is Amanda Bohr and we just um, purchased a lot on Blue Point. And I've talked with Kevin and recently had, I was just concerned about the overgrowth question. Um, I met with one of our neighbors and we have hired a lawn company, but we live in Austin right now. So just want to make sure that um, I don't know the rules of keeping your lawn yet, but we went by this past weekend and it's, was had been taken care of. So I just want to make sure we're not on the bad list. <laughs> no, you're, you're not on the, you're not on my list. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right. And you can always reach out Kevin to Kevin at the city hall. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Amanda. All right. No Kima Clear Lake Shores volunteer fire department. Kudos for them coming out last night and everything that went on Galveston County health district, Amy Weber. Good evening, Council. Um, for the month of August 13th through September 13th, <clears throat> we've had a total of 67 calls. Uh, 66 of those were in Kima. One was in Clear Lake Shores. Um, we did receive three mutual aids from our service in Baycliff. Um, a, a total of uh, 561 calls year to date. Um, average shoot time is one minute and average response time is five minutes. <clears throat> Most frequent calls that we're seeing out in your area is on the Kima boardwalk. And that is the end of my report. All right. I was scrolling down, I don't see anything else to show. Thank you, Amy. Any questions for Amy? Having none, we'll go to our city administrator, Brent Spear. Good evening, council, mayor, and visitors. Uh, we are currently uh, 28 weeks into this COVID pandemic. Uh, I'm happy to report that things are slowing locally. However, there seems to be a lot of renewed interest at the national level for obvious reasons and for uh, high profile cases that come to light. As far as the uh, COVID summary for Galveston County, uh, we're seeing, uh, seeing the numbers uh, really drop significantly with the new cases. Right now we're at 11,851. There's uh, 10,701 have recovered and uh, there's been no change in the last couple of weeks on, the, on deaths, but that still stands at 165. Uh, with Clear Lake Shores, we saw an uptick in our uh, active cases. Uh, we jumped from the mid-20s up to 44 in one day. Um, that was uh, closely related to uh, storm beta and uh, when they shut down 
a lot of the testing sites, they had an opportunity to pick up a lot of their reporting and their test uh, entries. So um, that's that explains that. It wasn't that we had that many cases. There were cases that were unreported uh, previously, but with uh, 44 confirmed cases within the city, 43 have recovered, so one active. I don't believe that they're hospitalized. Statewide, just a little over six and a half million uh, tests have been given. Uh, just shy of 800,000 confirmed, um, 700,000 recovered, and then they have unfortunately 16,000 deaths. But uh, Galveston County was uh, pretty high up on the county list. Harris County still leads the state with uh, confirmed cases at 148,000. That goes up. Of course, it is a population center. Galveston County uh, it continues to move further down. I think we were as high as fourth at one time, but now we're currently 15th in the state. So that's good. So that's a good trend. As far as loosening restriction, Governor Abbott's expected to uh, continue to evaluate uh, weather-related crises, the opening of schools that we're now um, full steam ahead on, and uh, reviewing data from Labor Day weekend. So. As that comes in, uh, I think those decision points will allow him to make uh, maybe some further uh, reductions or restrictions in some of the some of his orders. So we'll monitor that closely. As far as weather goes, uh, we have now a hurricane delta. Um, it's seven o'clock. Excuse me, that's uh, Apple telling me that it's seven o'clock. I'm working from the home office. The uh, uh, as far as Hurricane Delta goes, uh, right now it's category one, um, spinning through the Gulf, and it's expected to reach category three. And although it's not expected to impact us, uh, we have maybe a 10% chance of some tropical force winds. Uh, it is expected to uh, impact the Louisiana coast on Friday. And uh, that's, a, that's another whammy for a place that uh, it just really started to gain some traction from their last, uh, their last storm earlier this year. So uh, try to hold those people uh, close in your thoughts and prayers if you do that. And uh, we're not expecting a lot of rain to be a factor and surge high tides are expected to be somewhere between one and three feet. So it should be pretty quick. As far as uh, roads and drainage, uh, roads and drainage will be meeting, but I wanted to make you aware we did do some work uh, with Public Works on Cedar. Um, we uh, did some recontouring of a ditch, help remove a hump. There's not a lot of elevation to work for, so it's minimal slope, but we're hopeful during rain, next rain event, we'll see an improvement. And uh, that's to help out some homeowners that have brought that to our attention. If, uh, as you drive around the, uh, the city, you'll see that new stop blocks are in place. Um, the vendor left a little early, I think prior before completing uh, because of uh, Tropical Storm Beta was coming so uh, he's expected to return and complete some that were on the list that were not completed. We were not charged for them. We weren't charged for the crosswalk at Aspen and Clear Lake Road. Uh, that was put down and uh, beaded. However, it didn't uh, stay because of high traffic. Um, There's just not enough time to keep traffic off of it and through the day. So uh, that is the... Uh, that's the problem there. We're investigating other options to make that crosswalk. Also speaking of the crosswalk, I've identified the hardware for that and just uh, I need to do some uh, calculations on available space, but I believe we'll have an order placed here shortly for all of that and we can get started on installation. Can you explain that crosswalk? I'm not sure. Everybody yeah, knows. the crosswalk, uh, it, it's uh, sponsored by, paid for by uh, the EDC and the crosswalk is to hopefully improve pedestrian traffic from uh, the east parking lot across the street and to, and to slow people down uh, on Clear Lake Road. We have a lot of pedestrian traffic in there. It is a business center. People park on one side and walk to the other side to conduct business across Aspens to go to Aspen. So uh, the, uh, the intent is to make that safe for our pedestrian traffic. And we are, likely going to deploy a solar panel pair of uh, interconnected, uh, I guess, flashing strobe uh, crosswalk signs. So they'll be on, uh, you know, on heavy 
heavy poles. They'll have uh, ADA buttons. They'll communicate wirelessly and activate when you push a button and they'll, they're set on a timer to allow people to get across. So it's just an opportunity to make people aware that there's somebody in front of them. And, uh, you know, sometimes if you're not paying attention and you're used to just coming through there, you, it, uh, it could be tragic. So we're trying to, trying to uh, provide for people's safety. So we'll be moving forward with that. Uh, center point is also, if you're ever on Narcissus, you know that there's a large steel plate in the middle of the road. Center point is working on that. And uh, they're completing a leak, and then they anticipate pulling a new line down Narcissus. So uh, Narcissus has, has already been identified for repaving, and uh, this actually works out good. Normally, you repave a road, and then somebody comes in and has to do work on utility, so uh, and cutting up your road. So we're going to have uh, new gas services put in. They're all located usually in the streets. So they're all road cuts. Once they get those repaired, then we'll move forward with the repaving as the committee um, works through those options. So they were out last week working, uh, last two weeks actually working on that leak area, if you've noticed. On parks, uh, pools and parks met this past week after a long hiatus. Uh, at outside social distancing at the deep hole it was quite nice um, during our last storm event the uh, boat pier at uh, at shell bottom sustained some damage from a vessel we're addressing that damage uh, trying to handle it in in-house right now we should have repairs completed within the next few days i don't know if it'll be open for the for the weekend but we anticipate having at least uh, early next week um, so that, that is taken care of, and we're doing that in-house with Public Works, so um, trying to save costs. Uh, related to that, Texas Parks and Wildlife Grant, voter access grant is moving forward, and I've uh, requested a proposal from an engineering firm for stamp drawing, so they're aware of the project, and I sh should see that tomorrow, and uh, hopefully can move forward and uh, get the engineering and permitting out of the way for that. The Let's see, TxDOT is expected uh, to move forward with an environmental study regarding uh, possible dredging and installation of boat ramps at Kima under State Road 146. That's the first step. Uh, Portofino uh, is involved in that. And uh, we uh, introduced uh, kind of in introduced that project to, between uh, TxDOT to Portofino. So. Um, they're working through some of those issues, but hopefully there'll be uh, a more, uh, ec maybe not accessible, but more uh, appropriately configured boat ramp with parking uh, back where it used to be, where people are used to. So we would anticipate that is going to take place, that it would uh, offload our city ramp. That's uh, a good thing. Uh, city facility and use forms for parking lots and other areas have been reviewed by our city legal and uh, they are deployed. So uh, if people uh, have an event that they want to have uh, a sponsored event that, that's community related, like for instance, a blood drive and utilize one of the city parking lots um, out front. Uh, we have a form that allows them to do that. And we also have a a COVID-19 form that addresses, um, you know, they understand that they need to apply uh, the necessary precautions um, if they're going to do that event. Hope not to have to have COVID forms forever. So uh, as we work through that, um, eventually that COVID form will disappear, hopefully. But uh, it just details the expectations of the renter and for the time that they're using that asset. That's also been reviewed by City Legal. And I think that's it until we get into the agenda. Are there any questions? Bruce, I have two questions for you. Um, with regards to the stop sign stripping, striping, however you want to call it, was were the speed humps like in front of um, deep hole part of that project? No, they they were not. They were not uh, part of the striping project. Okay. And then my second question with regards to the damage at the boat ramp, is that something we can uh work with the owner of the vessel who damaged that property or do we just have to absorb that as 
our own cost? I, well, I haven't seen, I believe we have information regarding the vessel. I have not, have not seen that. I wanted to go ahead and get it fixed, number one. It wasn't a high priority as we were recovering from uh, last flood event. So I thought that was more important, put that on the back burner. And uh, so if we fix it, we're accumulating our costs and we'll know what that is. And then I think it would be appropriate to approach the, uh, the owner of the vessel. Well, we're trying to do so on a, on a very restricted budget and just trying to be very cognizant of our costs without uh, sending out to contract. Also with the, with the contractors right now, uh, there's an extended wait time before they can get to projects um, because they're working other storm damages. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, thank you, Brent. All right, next is uh, public comments. Um, let me address it first with, uh, you know, with the council meeting, uh, anybody in the audience or on the Zoom meeting may address, uh, you know, council, but I just wanted to go over a couple points that the, uh, the audience may speak on any item on the agenda after the city council has spoken. At that point, they can speak and, and as stated on the agenda, which is all, by the uh, House Bill 2840, they're limited to three minutes each and then cannot speak a second time. So just wanna remind everybody of that. Um, and at this time we have public comments. Um, any person with city related business may speak to this council in compliance with the Texas Open Meeting Act. The city council may not deliberate. Comments from public should be limited to a maximum of three minutes per individual. So at this time, um, I think there's a raise your hand uh, capability, or if you just want to speak up and uh, talk, and we'll recognize each person at this time, public uh, comments. Mayor, did you say that we were going to be able to speak on a certain item, agenda item after y'all talked about it, or do you want yes, to address yes. that now? Well, e either way, you can speak on it during public comments, and then when the agenda item comes up, you can speak. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll wait. All right. And then let's see what's that there. Yes? Uh, Brent Spear again. One thing I forgot to add to my lengthy report and apologize is that early voting starts on October 13th. So that'll be available at the clubhouse as well as other numerous voting centers throughout the county. Okay. And looks like Nancy Schwartz. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thanks to all of you for your time and your dedication to our city. I've been here 27 years and I've just seen it get better and better. So thanks so much for all your hard work and your time and effort. Thank you, Nancy. Anybody else speak up, please? All right, having no other items on number six, we'll go to item number seven, new business. Uh, consent agenda. Is there any items that would council would like to be pulled? Having none, is there any objections to the consent agenda by council? Having none, consent agenda is passed. Item number eight, council business discussion and possible made action may be taken on the following items. Item A, Discussion of temporary stop signs at Hanson Road and Drawer Road during construction at Farm to Market Road 2094 and Highway 146. I think Brent's got some few words to add to this before. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I've received some calls about uh, traffic that is located at this intersection. If you're familiar with it, there is there, or there are stop signs on the north-south which uh, access drawer to the south and coming off the parking lot at Target. Hanson Road uh, primarily goes east-west in that area. 
and has no stop signs. And with the increased traffic trying to get around the uh, State Road uh, or State Highway 146 and Farm to Market 2094, and now throwing in uh, a complete closure at FM 518, uh, we're just seeing a lot of traffic. The East West Road is in Clear Lake Shores, so it would be under uh, Clear Lake Shores ability um, to, to place uh, a couple stop signs even on a temporary basis. Um, I wouldn't suggest a full installation, just uh, maybe some on like uh, sawhorses, um, get people's attention and get them to slow down. Um, it's, just a, it's just a danger and we've had some near misses and people going off. And I spoke with uh, Police Chief Keel and he advised that the, the accidents aren't, aren't necessarily increased, but the severity of such accidents is increased, meaning that what used to be maybe a fender bender is now more of a, um, a, a more involved crash. So um, I bring that to the council to see if they would be interested in doing that. And uh, that's all I have. Uh, Mayor, I'll make a motion to uh, install temporary stop signs at Hanson Road and Drawer Road during construction at FM 2094 and Highway 146. I'll second that motion, Jan Bailey. So I have a question that's going to make it a four-way stop then, right? Yeah, temporarily it'll be a four-way Okay, cool. Is, is there, do we know, are there plans at all to put anything permanent there down the road or is that up to us is that a tech stop thing as far as hansen road that would be a clear lake shores uh, decision okay i think what i believe that once con once construction is it's not going to necessarily complete and be good but once they're able to open uh 2094 and 518 after placing their uh support beams and things i think it'll, it'll vastly improve it'll go back to what it was before Okay. Bill Moore first. Bill Moore first. I'm sitting there talking to myself. <laughs> I said, Brent, uh, would you be installing any stop blocks for that or is it just the stop signs? Those are not. I, uh, I hadn't considered stop blocks. I think maybe I can look at some, maybe some temporary taping or something like that. I wouldn't want to go so permanent that once they're removed that uh, they remain. Okay. All right. Any, any further discussion from council or public? Having none, uh, we had a motion and a second for the uh, installation of temporary stop signs at Hanson Road and Drawer Road. During the construction of FM 2094 and Highway 146, all in favor, aye. 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 And any opposed? Nay. Having none, motion passed unanimously. No. All right, next is item B action from public hearing for possible revocation of waterfront leases B 022, C 059B, C 080. C-086 and E-107. I think we can remove this from the agenda because they were all paid. I don't think there's any action required. Donna Lauren, do we need a, a, a motion just to, to, to delete this from the agenda? No, I don't think so. I think you can just take no action. All right, no action on item B. All right, item C is designation of representative of official alternate to the General Assembly and the Houston Galveston Area Council. And presently, Jan Bailey has been doing that and uh, she's volunteered to, to do it again, keep doing it. So that's my recommendation. And Christy Strope, I don't remember who was the alternate. Maybe Christy Lyons, since we got council changing out. 
I would have to look back, but I I thought it was Angie Terrell. I thought it was Angie as well, yeah. Ball motion for Jan Bailey to be our uh, representative to HGAC. Christy Lyons, do you want to be the alternate? Why not? I can tell you, and my alternate, I don't think ever had, when I was our rep, I don't think ever had to attend, or maybe once. So I haven't had to go. I'm, the, I'm our alternate. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I think it's only a meeting once a year, and I think it'll be after elections next year. So there you go. There you go. Okay, cool. I second the motion, then. <laughs> All right. Motion by Amanda Fenwick, second by Angie Terrell. Any discussion? No. All right, all in favor, aye. 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 Any, any opposed, nay? Having none, the motion passes unanimously. All right, item number D, ordinance 2020-19 and ordinance of the city council of the city of Clear Lake Shores, Texas, creating article six, short-term rentals of chapter 18 businesses and business registration of the code of ordinances establishing regulations and permitting requirement for operations of short-term rental and providing a penalty clause for violations. And I think Brent's got some stuff to address. Hello again, uh, on this ordinance, uh, this is, uh, this is a short-term rental ordinance that primarily allows us it allows would allow the city to register the short term uh, short term rentals so that we would have good contact information uh, in case there was a problem with them. Some some of these uh, owners are remote, and uh, let's see, I'm kind of looking here. I think I believe this ordinance will be actually 2020 dash 20 instead of 19, um, the, the Scribner error, apologize. Allow, would allow the city to uh, contact those owners, um, some of them that are remote um, in case there was a problem. It also provides an opportunity for our uh, fire marshal to make an inspection and approve these for occupancy for rentals. Um, as you know, we recently had our fire marshal um, brought that online, have that program running now uh, on the commercial side. And, uh, you know, there's been, uh, would also allow us an opportunity to capture the hotel occupancy tax. That tax has been uh, by ordinance um, for either hotels or for short term rentals since uh, 2017. So it was ordinance 2017. Uh, dash zero six, and uh, we have great difficulty in identifying the short-term rental owner, uh, getting records. Uh, I've attempted through the various, uh, you know, the, the various websites, uh, those programs. Um, as yet, they're not required to to grab that tax for the locals, and uh, so they're not doing it, and. Uh, they're currently doing sales tax for other things, but um, I've been un unsuccessful in doing that. So with them registering, making sure that their places are safe, uh, we're providing safe, safe place within the city for people to come and visit. And I did receive some correspondence, but I do believe uh, the person that sent the letter is actually online. And I believe she will uh, speak to that. Um, this is a chow fant, but uh, I also have uh, Lauren Smith with Olson and Olson. He did provide a review of this, uh, and he can speak to that. But I will let you know that this was uh, copied basically and uh, massaged from another municipality, uh, similar size and structure, and uh, you know, I believe it it hits all the marks. So. If there are any questions, I, uh, or if you'd like to hear from Lauren, I think he could probably give you an overview as well. He's seen a lot of these. 
Right. My comment is that uh, uh, different cities are trying to do different things with short term rentals uh, in terms of you guys want to allow them, but regulate them and make sure that they're paying the HOT fees. Uh, I think this gets you there. This requires a registration, it requires a local contact. And uh, um, and once you get those two things together, I, I think you're you're there. I thought it was was well written. I reviewed it, and I, I think it's good. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I'd like to make a motion to. This is Angie Terrell. I'd like to make a motion to discuss Ordinance 2020-19, the ordinance creating articles regarding short-term rentals. I'll second for discussion. Um, so it sounds like to me, um, what I'm hearing is that the reason that this is being instituted is for safety with the contact information for a fire marshal ex inspection for safety and for the hot tax. What kind of hot tax are we looking at as far as income for the city? Is this, um, what is that for us? I, uh, I can't. I can't speak to the to the volumes of the hot tax. I have no idea. I have no, I don't know. How Until long I start there. registering the reporting, we won't know. I know that. In uh, terms uh, of, what, what's the rate? Isn't it seven percent? Or it used to be. It may not be anymore. But I think it's an additional seven percent of the uh, of the rental fee. Let me run, I'm going to run check it real fast. Yeah, that's why I believe it was 7%. So is, is to get into compliance with being able to track all the STRs in the city. Sorry, sir, what's, what's STR? I'm sorry. Short-term rental. Short-term oh. rental. All right, so, so I have a question. So if we're going to get in line with a hot tax, safety and registering, okay, so this, it seems like this ordinance is not specifically addressing those three things. That's what I'm hearing so, is that, Lauren, is that what you're talking about? What, what are the other two things you said three? I'm sorry, I missed it. No, you said, you said the hot tax we're addressing. We're addressing right. safety and we're addressing registration, correct? Correct, correct. Okay. So I'm kind of not. With regard to safety, I don't think we're we're addressing safety within the okay. individual structures. In other words, I don't think we're requiring uh, 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 fire sprinklers or fire alarms or anything of that nature, uh, which is a, a different entity altogether. If you want to start treating them like hotels, uh, well, but I'm but I'm seeing that there are inspections required and all. I mean, right. I'm just looking this ordinance and seeing what what is our focus and wh where what's our goal with this ordinance the, the, the focus is to identify by getting them to register so that we've got a contact and if there's something that comes up we can we can address it and, okay. and to uh, obtain compliance with the uh, hotel occupancy tax which is is probably a minor issue but it's, you know at this point it's going by without anybody knowing what they are and, and to add to that, there's a lot of cities that were behind the curve on this, and it's it's yeah in, in front of that. I don't know if you've seen the news with like Galveston County or city of Galveston with all the stuff that they went through. So it's it's not really the intent right. to, to upset anything other than get us in compliance, mm -hmm. so that way we can can monitor and control it and collect our hot tax. They're they're running, um, you know, there are essentially businesses that are. are mm -hmm brand inside our city limits yeah so those are those are those registered all the other businesses are registered right no i i totally i totally understand that portion i guess i'm just reading into you know what are the definitions of some of this stuff if our goal is to collect a hot tax then i think that's absolutely great um I, I'm, I'm just wondering about the the goals of it so so i've looked at jamaica beach i've looked at and I hear what you're saying about Galveston. I've looked at that, looked at Kima, um, several different uh, cities. So this, I guess I'm just confused about a lot of the wording and, I, and I'd like to, uh, I guess, ask some explanation about our goal with this ordinance. I, 
I think the goal is to identify where the short-term rentals are, get, okay. a point of, get a point of contact so that if something yeah. happens at that, at that premises, we've got somebody that we can address and, and, and deal with some safety issues. Beyond that, I think that's really the issue is registration, identification, and, and contact. And Brent, am I missing anything? No, that's exactly it. And I've spent a lot of mm -hmm. time trying to locate these short-term rentals. You can you can do a search, and you know I've identified one, but, but and talked to them a few times. But the uh, you know the the ability to know who to contact or you know to make them aware of the hotel occupancy tax that's been you know, on the books for three years and uh, mm -hmm. they just they're not aware of it and so so the, it so i have a question so it's not going to be like we're going to be monitoring airbnb and seeing who's renting what on the island right we're not no gonna be that's not that's not a, that's not possible we can't do that okay well but so if i'm a short-term renter what's stopping me from not coming to register with the city i mean is it because what's the penalty? There's a there's a, a criminal penalty if you don't do that. Uh, there's obviously an education component uh, that they've got. You, you know, you've got to make it known that this ordinance exists. Uh, most people that if they've got an Airbnb in, uh, in in another place, they probably know that something like this exists. <coughs> And, and frankly, we're probably going to find out about it on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, and I guess what I'm really asking is, are we really going to enforce it? I see what the penalty is. I, I misstated that. Are we as a city really going to enforce it? That's the thing. We, we have an issue with enforcing our <laughs> current ordinances that we have. So are we really going to enforce this? And, or are we going to tell somebody, oh, don't do it again or come register? I don't know. Um, I have an issue with the inspection piece of it. I, I think that's up to people to decide whether or not they want to rent somebody. If it's a crummy place, that's up to them. If they want to rent it, um, I don't know that the city needs to be involved in that piece. I don't mind collecting a hot tax. That's what the hot tax is for. Um, you know, we thought we were going to have a hotel and other things to collect that with. So um, we don't right now, uh, you know, and I understand having a con wanting to have a contact. Um, I think that's legit, especially if, if people don't live here. Um, the inspection piece is, is where I don't agree with this, um, but that's just me. Amanda, I echo that. I have a hard time with the inspection as well. The registration for safety, the hot tax, but again, is this going to be another one of our ordinances that we have on the books and we, we can't enforce? We're not going to go out and, and search on Airbnb or BBRO. So, I mean, do, do we... I mean, it, it's going to just be another thing for residents to fuss. Okay, here's another ordinance and we're not enforcing it or selectively in their minds enforcing it. I, I have a hard time with that too. Well, also, Lauren, hold on. I, I, I'd like to add something. If we're going to craft this, and I, and I went to the goals, if we're going to craft it as a hot tax, if we're going to craft it as registration, if we're going to craft it as a contact, that's what we need to craft it as, not as someone having liability for renters or whatever, you're getting into a whole host of issues that are not right. We have ordinances already in place for noise, for everything else. The other thing that I read in this thing, it was talking about you could not have any, it, it, and I believe I'm reading it right, it says weddings, it says parties, it says gatherings unless that location is in a commercial zone. So I have a problem with that. So what is a gathering? Is that two people? Does that mean that if there's an Airbnb on the island and there are two people sitting outside of that Airbnb, that's a gathering. So then you're giving someone accountability for someone that is a short-term lessee. I, I just don't think, if, if our goal is, the three things I'm going back to, uh, the hot tax, um, getting a contact and registering them, I'm all for it. And I'd like to see something like that crafted if that is important to anyone else. All the other stuff is addressing ordinance we already have in place. That's my opinion. 
I have a question too about the compliance with the other law. So basically it's stating that, you know, if you're, if you have the renter, um, so basically if the renter creates a, a criminal act, is the home, is the homeowner or the short-term rental liable for that act? Is, it, is that what I'm reading? Only if he was aware. I mean, he had to have some knowledge. You can't be liable for criminal criminal act without some mental state. You have to have some awareness or at least a, a, in a state of criminal negligence. In other words, you were so negligent, you should have known. So no, you know, if it's something that's purely the renter, um, you know, the renter comes in with, uh, uh, you know, and starts dealing marijuana from, from the, the Airbnb. No, the, the, the owner is not going to be liable for that. Okay. Unless they, you know, they knew about it beforehand. All right. Is there a way, to, like kind of going with what Jan said, is there a way to recraft this that we just, we cut out a lot of this stuff and we just bring it down to, we have a hot tax and you're, you need to pay that and you need to register your short-term rental and give us your contact information. Is there a way to, to streamline it to that? And then define what short-term rental consists of because what, how long is a short-term rental? Because for some people it's three days. I believe that's actually so the, the ordinance said 30 day, under 30 days. That's what I thought too. Days. Yeah, I would be in less than 30 consecutive days. Yeah, I would be in favor of taking it back, stripping it down to your point, Angie, and, and coming back with something that um, has the hot tax, the... Uh, right, def redefine the goals of what we want in this and not be this long for something so short and sweet. Yeah. So it was the hot tax? It was the hot tax? It was uh, the contact. And identifying where the short term rentals are. Right, right. That's the right. So it's tax yeah. and registration. Yes, right. the registration number. Yes. That's the three things. In, in terms of definition, are you all okay with 30 days? I am, yeah. Are you saying consecutive? It's I mean, 30 I, days, it's right. specific. Yeah, it does it's say specific. specific. Well, we, we, we have to draw a line somewhere. It's up to you right. where you want to draw the line. Yeah, that's pretty standard. Um, you know, if you go to to some of the you know the Airbnbs, VRBO sites, etc. I think you get into a you know two three month lease. You're now talking about a longer term lease. Yeah, right. Right. Anything under thirty consecutive is that standard? Pretty much. That's the way I've seen it. Yeah, I'm with you guys then. I, the, it, streamline it down to the, the hot tax, um, the registration, and within that registration, that could identify where the short-term rentals are located. So, so pretty much those two things. And within the registration, the owners for safety concerns or whatever, the address for where they're located, and then you got to pay hot tax because you're a business. And, and right. what about the uh, operational requirements out of the paragraph that's showing there. Uh, some of those things are just like contact information being posted at the place because sometimes they come in and I'm not saying this is here. I think we got some of the greatest SDRs, but if it ever here. changes, we want to have the right ordinances in place. So here's my question. Here's my question is the, the lessee, the person that is leasing that property, they're responsible for that. We're not. I mean, shouldn't they be the person that is telling their lessee what they're responsible for? I'm not. I'm not clear about what that's all about. Well, it's about public safety. Yeah. Okay. Tell, tell me about. Educate me about that because I don't know. Well, in my mind, just as like you go in a hotel, you have emergency information, or a right. Right, right. How to get out, how to no. get out of the hotel. Yeah. Well, 
there are a lot of things that are required in the hotel that are not being required here, like fire sprinklers and fire alarms and that kind of stuff. We haven't gotten into this, but uh, you know, tell us where you want us to go, and we'll 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 give you that ordinance. What I'm hearing is registration, um, identification, uh, and and uh, minimum safety standards. Well, wait, Lauren, what do you mean by minimum safety standards? Could you clarify what your understanding is? My, my understanding is that, that, you know, there's at least a contact person so they, you know, who to, to, to get to oh. if there's an issue at that address. Uh, I would suggest that, that, you know, while everybody has the, uh, the right, I suppose, to, to uh, uh, rent a crummy place, uh, crummy should have a floor that there there's that it shouldn't go beneath beneath so that you've defined what you know you, you can you can uh, you can uh, at least a, a crummy place here but it, it can't be so crummy that it's unsafe That's okay and Lauren my question is my question is is the city what why is that our concern that should be between the lessee and the person I mean I don't because the, the, state has, me, so. the state has delegated to the cities the the duty of determining what is safe with regard to structures in terms of schools uh, other commercial buildings the cities have the uh, the duty to determine that they're safe okay I understand that that but that's not our build I mean I, I'm really asking for understanding. So it's not our building, it's someone else's. I want it to be safe. I'm not saying I don't, but how does how does a city of Clear Lake Shores get involved in someone else's property and how they're managing their property? Does that make sense? I just, I'm just asking questions. No, I, under, I understand your question uh, clearly, but the Texas legislature has has delegated to the cities the, the duty of determining that buildings are safe. That's one of the things that do that they do. They they delegate to the school districts the uh, job of educating the children, and they have delegated to the cities the job of making sure that buildings are safe. So, is it possible that liability that cities put being placed out there? It's possible, but it's a governmental function, and so it's probably probably not going to be something that will bind us, you know. But uh, you, you know, if if you don't want to engage in that, we don't have to. We can, we can limit it to registration, identification, and and uh, uh, payment of hot taxes. I mean, don't we have other ways other ways of people reporting unsafe conditions? I mean, Kevin, you gave us a earlier. Mm -hmm. You had a report of a of a house, and you had to, you know, go through the judge to get a writ of entry and all and all that. I mean, aren't there other ways that the city or that people have or residents have of reporting an unsafe? House? Yes, I mean, we do have an unsafe structure ordinance, and yes, in some cases, I do have to go in and inspect the property. It takes a judge. It takes a judge's order to go inside. Uh, it's a very long and lengthy process. I, I think what we're looking at here is really just the tenants for a safe place to stay. The, the inspection side of it is not very complicated. Basically, you go in, you make sure there's a fire extinguisher there, you make sure there's a smoke detector or a carbon monoxide detector, uh, you know, things of that nature. Uh, when you start getting into unsafe structures, you start getting into things that are really dangerous, like exposed electric or the floors falling in or, or there's holes in the walls that allow vermin to go in and out. That's not the case in a short term rental. You're really looking at the bare necessities of safety. It's not we're not regulating this, the STRs to the point that, oh, you're you have a small crack in your tile, replace it. That's not the case here. It's strictly the bare minimums of safety to make sure that if something were to happen, that there's someone to contact, whether 24 yeah. seven, 
if if God forbid, you know, let's say someone's renting it and the gas water heater is is is, is leaking carbon monoxide, that the people are notified that hey, this is an issue. Maybe you need to get your butt out of the house. It's really the Kevin, you're, Kevin, you're speaking to my point. Lauren, you were talking about school district, that's tax dollars. We're not responsible for Airbnbs. The the owner is. So so that's where we're I, I'm not understanding. I hear what you're saying, Kevin. It's not the city's responsibility. It's 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 the Airbnb owner. It's not on us. And, and maybe that should be a part of the ordinance. And we have a way, granted it's a lengthy process, I get it, but we have a way for those types of things to be reported and, and handled rather than going in as an inspection as part of a short-term rental. So I have a question. So you inspect commercial properties once a year, correct? Yes, I try to. Yes, so does the fire marshal. And then so if a short-term rental comes up, you would only inspect it if something was wrong, right? So it wouldn't really be as a red flag or anything to actually go out there and look at it. As the short-term rental is written right now, it is a once a year inspection, just like any other business. I don't go in every other tenant. You know, let's say somebody leaves, they, they stay for three weeks or three days, whatever, and I don't come back in right after that three days. It's just once a year. And, and you're it, talking about written in this proposed ordinance, not the rules that are out there right now. Correct. Yeah. Right now, you don't do any inspection. Like right this. now, yeah, right now, I'm, I, ha I cannot go in unless I have a judge's order to go in. And typically when those come up, it, it's usually from the tenant, something happened. Uh, and in some cases it's because the tenant wasn't happy with the rental or they weren't happy with their relationship with the, the leasee. And they're just trying to get back. Um, again, these inspections are very rudimentary it is literally you walk in and 10 minutes later you walk out. I'm not there for two hours going through the attic to make sure they have the proper insulation or that they're, you know, there's a, basically there's a map on the wall saying these are the ways out. I look under the cabinet to see if there's a fire extinguisher. I test the smoke detectors and the carbon monoxide detectors. I look in the electric panel, make sure that it's labeled properly. So if something does happen, they can go and turn it off in 10 seconds. That's about it. And that's only one. I'm sorry, I didn't make the motion, but whatever you want to, here's my suggestion, craft something that looks good that we can look at. I just don't feel like the city should be responsible for anything. It's a homeowner's issue. Yes, I think it's a commercial deal, but it's, it, it falls in a, in a, it's a different animal. I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert on this. So I just, my recommendation or whatever my opinion is, is craft something different, bring it back. Let's look at it. Yeah, the motion was to discuss, so. Yeah. This is Angie. I just had a question, um, maybe Kevin and Lauren. It, so in Texas, when you're dealing with residential leases or sales, the Texas Real Estate Commission has various promulgated forms crafted to deal with safety issues and what is okay and what's not okay in a home to be leased. And, and then the, the leasor and the leasee sign that and then they've agreed to that binding contract. Is there something like that for short-term rentals that, that is used universally in the state of Texas? Or I mean, is, are these not even contracts going in is I'm looking to see if there's any protection like is offered in a residential lease or purchase situation that Texas has set up. Is there any kind of protection in a VRBO like this or short term rental um, for the folks that are renting? I, I don't have any knowledge of that. Okay. I, I think Lauren stated it best is the state leaves it up to the municipalities to to govern and regulate them. Okay, understand. Thank you.
So Lauren, the motion was to discuss. Do we need to make a motion to have you come back with, or have our team come back with something else, or? I don't think you have a, uh, I don't think you need to make a motion, I believe, unless Brent tells me otherwise, I think we have uh, uh, a direction from council on that issue. Brent? Brent? Okay, I feel like we have direction on that issue. You have to make a motion to do something with it. Yeah. Well, you've got a motion to discuss. Right, but then after you discuss, you have to do something with the item. So you can motion to, to table it and for the uh, city to go off and work and come back within X amount of weeks. Um, another recommendation, since it sounds like we get a bunch of different opinions, is to maybe possibly assign two council members um, and two, I mean, this is my recommendation, two people, two citizens, res residents to a committee and have them go off for three or four weeks. It's, it's I mean, none, none of this is in a big hurry and, and bring it back. It's just something that's been in work with the city for a long time with the COVID and stuff. It probably would have came back a lot earlier, but we've had a lot of complaints and, and this is what folks have been asking for. And that's why it's in front of council. And, and I'll add that the, the bigger bigger thing is that it's hard to collect tax if you don't know who to who to make aware of it and 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 tell them the process. So it's difficult to locate anyone when they're not registered. And if they're going to run it as a business, then it needs to be registered similar to a business. So we have that opportunity. And that is one one thing that's taken the devoted a lot of city employees time in looking into the hot tax and, and having no way to to go and gather that. So again, on Angie's point, you know, here's just another ordinance that we don't do. And, and I've made it, uh, you know, my thing that, you know, there's a lot of things that the city wasn't doing and we're doing. I mean, we weren't even registering businesses every year. And that's been a requirement, you know, for a long time. And it's not just to go out and collect the money. The money is not the big thing. It's about having contact information. So when their businesses are on fire or something like that, we have POCs to be able to call those folks. I feel like we have direction, Brent. Yeah, that's fine. If, if whatever, whatever direction council wants, if they want to uh, leave it with, with legal for uh, to be crafted, or if there's a recommendation. We'll, we'll bring back a scale plan version in a month. That would be fine with so, me. So does Angie need to vamp her motion, or does somebody else just make a motion to or have motion? What's that in order to have Laurel? Your, you your only motion this. so far was just to have discussion. Right. Okay, yeah. so I'll make a motion not. for Lauren to recraft this ordinance and, and bring it back to us in 30 days. Perfect. I'll second. Who, who second? Amanda. Okay, so a motion by Christy, second by Amanda for city to go back and work and how long to come back? 30 days. 30 days. You, need, you need to, if you're gonna do 30 days, then that means you're gonna have a meeting that date. So you need to specify which meeting you want yeah. it brought back to. Think it's the, the November meeting. The you know, we're gonna have a brand new council in a month from now, maybe make it for at least, give them like a meeting to get in and then maybe the next meeting after that. Or bring it to the November meeting and put it on early on the agenda before we all do the switch. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. That's so make it for November third meeting and put it one, two, or three. Okay. November third is actually election day, so. That is right. That's right. So if you're going to have a meeting on November third, it would be fine because you can't canvass the election the day of the election. <laughs> Yeah, so at the next meeting, we may need to move our council meeting to November 4th. So just the, what? the first meeting in November, Christy. Okay. okay. That would work. We also, okay. we also need to consider when they're sworn in. That's another. Well, yeah. It's, it's another they be sworn in. They're, they're not going to be sworn in, on, sworn in on November 4th. you got to canvas no. everything, Jan. Right. You've got to wait at least, what, three days, I believe? 
November 6th is the first date that you can canvas. Right. Okay, so the motion is Friday. Well, you can canvas from the 6th to the 17th. Right, but I don't think most people are going to be canvassing on the 6th because that's, I think that's a Friday. No. Okay. We'll, we'll typically do a, a special meeting to canvas. Do I have to this motion again? I, I, I would stick with first meeting in November. Okay. <laughs> There's a motion. The motion is for Lauren in the city to recam, recraft the ordinance for short term rentals and bring it back to us by the first meeting in November. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Amanda, you second. Sorry, yes. Yes, you second? I second. All right. So I have a motion by Christy Lyon, second by Amanda Fenwick. Any further discussion and or by public? This is Bill Shelfence, and I'd like to speak if I could for a moment. Sure. Uh, I have no problem with registering. That's fine. I have no problem with paying the tax, but I do have a massive problem, which Mr. Smith addressed a little bit, but I don't think that I'm in agreement with him. In uh, Section 18-137, it talks about the owner should not be relieved from any civil or criminal liability, no matter who does it. Uh, that's a deal killer. I mean, I heard Mr. Smith say, well, you'd have to actually know what was going on. And I'm not sure that I agree with that. I think it, uh, a future counsel or a future attorney could certainly say, oh, it doesn't say that. And I think that really needs to come out of there because if, as written, I am criminally liable for something that an Airbnb guess it does. No, you're not. It requires well, that's what it says. criminal, it, no. It requires a criminal mental state. If you do not have a criminal mental state, you're not criminally liable for it. But that's where it comes in with the culpability clause, that's, which I've always questioned. Who, that, who determines the culpability? A jury? <laughs> I don't want this to have to go to a jury. Really? That's where I'm coming from. I, I don't think that it really adds anything to it and it sure puts every airbnb or vrbo host that's that's one of the things that will probably be, that's one of the things that will probably be coming out of the tailored down version of this ordinance yeah i, I would appreciate that and I, I don't have any problem with the rest of it but that is that's scary potentially very scary is there a screening of some sort of who is able to lease uh, when we I'm sorry, were you asking, we screen every person thoroughly and so does Airbnb. The platform we use for our short-term rental is Airbnb. And they screen every person that goes to them to rent and then we do a further screening of anyone who rents our property. And our property law, I mean, our rules are what you all have been asking for. We have the noise ordinance, we have the trash pickup you know, details and we limit it to two adults only and we do not allow you know any overnight guests we're very strict on what we allow and i think there's other airbnb owners on the island who do have the same kind of rules that we have Catherine, i have a quick question are y'all do y'all are y'all required to have a license to operate an airbnb airbnb does not require that they don't. Okay. The state of Texas does not require that you have a license? No. Okay. And the city does not at this point. And also, I want to address um, the issue about not being able to identify the owners. The tax rolls on Galveston County are available 24-7 online. Anyone can go in and research the property address very easily find out who the owner is, and it has the address of the owner. It's very easy to find out who owns any property in any, any town, any county in the state of Texas. Those records are not wholly accurate. 
Yep. Well, it's, it's what it's what's the taxes are based on, and I believe, you know, they keep the tax records up to speed. Right. We have to stop there. That's been three minutes. I'm sorry. Thank you for letting us speak. Yeah, thank you for speaking. Um, I have a quick question. Does the city not have records on all of their, I mean, everybody that lives here in Clear Lake Shores? No. Population they, record? No. Mm -mm. They don't. Mm -mm. No. Galveston County Appraisal uh, District does, but that doesn't mean that whoever is registered to that home or owns that home is the people that are actually living in it. It's not okay. accurate because we just purchased the Gal the how the lot on Blue Point, and I had to call Galveston County, and the correct. Uh, records don't start until 2021. Wow. Okay. All right. No further discussion. Um, I'd like to say something. My name is Angela Fleury Lester and I have a house on Pine. Um, I'm one of the Airbnb houses. It is on my home first. I'm not able to live there full time because I live in the city. I work in the city during the week and it is a rental short-term rental second. I'm really surprised this even came up for discussion or, or on the agenda when nobody on the panel even knows how much the hot tax is. Um, I know through Airbnb, they, the, sit, the Galveston County tax and I think Kima tax is already coming out. It goes by the uh, zip code. So that's gonna be something and I don't mind help and I'd love to answer questions for you guys. I know three minutes isn't gonna be enough time, but. Um, I don't mind helping and answering any questions that y'all have. I think that um, if you're gonna do a short-term inspection for safety, um, there's a couple of issues I have with that. First of all, uh, the inspector now, he's saying what's gonna be inspected, what's not. That What if a new inspector comes down three years later and he's like, well, those aren't the right handrails or your house isn't high enough or, you know, and he starts creating his own uh, inspection rules. Um, I also, um, like to know you said you had complaints. I'm, I'm very curious I, about complaints from Airbnb renters. <laughs> um, you know, who's complaining? Is it neighbors? Is it, you know, because a lot of times they come in, you don't even know they're here. Most of my renters, 80% of my renters have been through people on the island that have rented for either a business client or they have rented for a family that's coming in, an additional, additional room for family. Um, so it's not like that. I, I rented uh, Catherine's house before I bought my own. I rented from her on her as Airbnb guest. So I think that maybe on your panel or what, whatever you have your discussion that you might want to have one of the actual Airbnb representatives there to help you and maybe maybe guide you through some of these things that you've had questions on tonight. That would be my suggestion. Any further discussion? Thank you. Having none, take a vote. All in favor, aye. 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 And all opposed, nay. Having none, motion passed to uh, bring this back at the first meeting in November. All right, next one is ordinance 2020-20, an ordinance of the city of Clear Lake Shores, Texas amending its code of ordinances by deleting certain language referring to maximum speed and number of wheels from the definition of golf cart in section 78-175, definitions of article seven, operation of golf carts on public streets of chapter 78, traffic and vehicles, amending section 78-176, golf carts permitting and restricting of article seven, operation of golf carts on public streets of chapter 78, traffic and wheels to allow golf carts within the city limits south of FM 2094, providing a penalty and amount but not to exceed $200, providing for severability and making certain findings of fact. 
I don't know if Brent or Chief Keel wants to speak on this. That's a lot of words. This is Brent. Uh, the things that uh, the, the golf cart meaning's been changed, and Lauren can speak to that. And as you referenced, the three wheels and the and the speed. But uh, more importantly, our ordinance that was on the on the books uh, only allowed people to operate golf carts on public streets um, of Clear Lake Shores north of 2094. So there was no. Uh, that's been changed uh, with the suggested change, change in language to just be within the city of Clear Lake Shores. So not identifying geographically. That's correct. And the, de the, the change in the definition is just to match the change that the transportation code made to the definition of golf cart. Uh, there, your definition uh, uh, referred to uh, three wheels or more. There is no reference to that in the uh, transportation code definition, and also had a maximum speed. And that's not in the golf cart in the uh, transportation code definition of golf cart. So, just wanted to make that match the transportation code, and then it changes the uh, 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 the location or, or where you can drive them to just anywhere in the city of Clear Lake Shore. I'd like to make a motion to approve ordinance 2020-20 as written. A second. A motion by Angie, second by Mr. Thompson. Any discussion? So I have a question. And, and so I, I know I emailed Brent and I think Lauren, you were in on this. With, with regards to House Bill 1548 um, and operating a golf cart at night, the house bill says that you can't operate at night. So are we cool with that? Do we need to, does that not need to be included in here? I, I talked to Mays Middleton and he, he said the intention was not to not allow it, but if cities are going to allow it, it should be in a local ordinance. So the house bill actually says that you can't operate a uh, golf cart at night without certain minimum equipment to allow it to operate at night, such as headlights, and slow moving vehicle signs. And that was already in your ordinance. Again, yeah, also that was applicable to on streets at 35 miles an hour. You can't operate at night, but within the neighborhood you can. So you have to be careful on the verbiage. There's commas after all that. Right, the requirement was that, that the additional language was that you had to have certain things like headlights and, and slow moving vehicle stickers which was already in your ordinance. The only thing that we changed was, was the location where you can drive them. Well, it says in section 55.403, operation authorized in certain areas. An operator may operate a golf cart, colon, and it says in a master plan community that has a uniform set of restrictive covenants for which a county or municipality- So, you meet, so stop there and you meet that, right? Right. Okay. So you go on down and it says during the daytime and not more than two miles from the location where the golf cart is usually parked for transportation to or from a golf course. So, so that's why I'm confused. Yeah. Each one's by itself. So it says you may operate a golf cart during the daytime. So to me, that means you can't operate it during the nighttime. That's, well, I'm just trying to one, clarify that. There's one that says you're not at night. That there is language in there, and I, I'd have to find it. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. I wasn't. I couldn't there. find it, and and so yeah. Well, then why? My question would be: Is why do they require to have headlights? Then that's and that's what I asked Mays. I said because he co-authored the build, and I said I'm looking for some clarification because I'm hoping you can assist. And I gave that section five five one dot four zero three. I said, is the intent that the golf carts are not to be driven at night? even though section 551.4041 states that headlamps are a requirement. And he said, it's not intended to prohibit golf carts at night. They're just not allowed at night um, and in an unincorporated part of the county. And if the city wants to allow it, they need to have it in an ordinance. So I'm just, I don't know if this makes a difference for the police. I don't know <coughs> if we're splitting hairs here. I, and if you can find the piece, Lauren, that says that, um, it's it's okay to drive at night, then I'm cool. 
I apologize. I wasn't anticipating this question, but I'm looking at it right now. So, Mindy, you're saying you just want to put it in there for protection, just in case, right? Well, Is that I had a discussion with the police chief, or I sent, or Jay did, or somebody did, and it was there was confusion about whether or not golf right. carts are technically allowed to operate. I'm just asking if we we're splitting the hair, or we're trying to get so specific with other things. If that just needs to be there, or if it doesn't, that's that's all I'm asking. So I was pulling up what's on the DMV. And the way it reads, and I, I went and checked this with the 1548, and it's, I mean, it's, the words are somewhat extrapolated out, but it's golf carts and with a golf cart license plate may be operated on roads in the following situation. So each one of these meet that. So this, this one here is with the, what you're talking about during daytime. Right. So that, to me, means you can't drive it at night. Right. If, I'm I, if I'm misinterpreting that, then, no, then I'm it's saying, it. No, it's saying each one you can. So well, there's nothing in there that says anything about nighttime. It says only has, the but, drive but, it from the day. But this one here, in a master plan community with uniform set of restrictive covenants and a, and a county or municipality approved plat. So we have, that's what, that's the reason what drives each city to establish golf cart ordinance and that's why we have one in place back when the original rules were out there and they required license um, you weren't able to have golf carts in a community in a city so that's the reason why the city created its ordinances and now that is what governs that that's from my understanding of my phone calls with folks I think that the I think that I'm pulling up the statute. Give me just a second. Then the same thing you can cross. I look at this. I just don't have it in front of me. You can cross intersections, but you can't travel on a 35 to 35 mile an hour road at nighttime. But you can during the daytime. Um, you can cross it. I think the word highway is a definer, isn't it? The, highway, the word highway is in there, but let me find it. Yeah, so you can drive on a highway with posted speed limit 35 miles out during the daytime, not more than two miles. I would not consider Clear Lake Road a highway. It, right. In, in well, it's also 20 miles an hour. Correct. I looked at this. I'm, I apologize. I don't have my notes in front of me right now. That's okay. I, I mean, that, I think we're splitting hairs here. I would just say we just need if, if come back and it needs to be added, then it, it's just another change to the ordinance, I guess. Yeah, we could, I mean, uh, it needs to be very specific. It needs to be specific. We can have Chief Keel look into this and and work with uh, Lauren and come back. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I, I apologize. It's, I don't think it changes the ordinance at this time, but it's something we can additionally look into. I, I, it doesn't change. I, I looked at it. That, that language was already there. And um, and and um, you guys already had that language. The the only thing that really changed was where you could drive them. But but let me find it. I'm sorry, I, I don't have it in front of me. I I did not save that research. I did the research. I just didn't save it. My bad. So here's my question. So if we're only putting it so we can only drive it in Kerr Lake Shores, when the bridge and all the construction's done, we're not allowed in Kima on our golf cart then, correct? We don't have jurisdiction in Kima. That's up to Kima. Yeah, this is just for the city of Kerr Lake Shores. When you leave the city and you go into League City or Kima, you're underneath their jurisdiction. Okay, gotcha. So what I'm understanding is we're going to leave it as written and then if we need after consulting with Chief and Lauren if we need to add the night clause we will. Is that what we're going to do? That's what I would recommend. Okay, that's I, I like that idea too.
So we had a motion, and I don't remember, Christy, who, who made the motion? I did. Angie and Terrell made the motion, and, and then um, Mark seconded it. Mark seconded it. All right. Any further discussion? I mean, none. All in favor, aye. Aye. I put my mute fast enough. So, okay. Oh, uh, wait. Do we, does it need? Okay, never mind. Okay. Aye. Mark, do you have a question, Mark? Yeah. No, I do not. Everybody's eyes. And then, Aye. Uh, Aye. Any nays? Having no nays and all eyes, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, item F, ordinance 2020-21, an ordinance of the city of Crow Lake Shores amending its code of ordinances to add a new Section 78-104, parking on waterfront lots limited to leasees and guests of Division 2, no parking, tow-away zone of Article 5, stopping, standing, and parking of Chapter 78, traffic and vehicle providing that it shall be unlawful for any person other than waterfront leasee or a guest of the waterfront leasee to park a motor vehicle vehicle or trailer on waterfront lot, establishing tow away zones, providing for a penalty in amount not less than $10 and not more than $200 for any violation hereof, providing for severability and making certain finding a fact. And I, I can tell you one thing that does need to be stricken is the, the reference of a trailer because that's it goes against the waterfront leases um, trailers aren't supposed to be parked on the waterfronts um, but uh, other than that print did you want to comment uh, Lauren has this but it was in reference to we do receive complaints about people parking on uh, waterfront leases um, it happens frequently we've had some that are um, probably garner a little bit more attention but it does happen frequently and we have visitors that come to the city and access public areas and park along waterfronts. And so this was to address that uh, issue um, primarily. And um, I think that Warren can explain, uh, there was a question possibly on right of way and Warren can explain process on that we're working the issue with regard to trailers it just it just copies the uh the the uh, no parking ordinance uh that occurs earlier in this uh division of the the code uh with regard to the right of way uh, the city will be enforcing this as the city not as the landowner of the the land that is being leased and that being the case the city can enforce this on its rights of way as well because the, the rights of way belong to the city and they can define what, what happens in those rights of way. So this is Angie, I'd like to make a motion to discuss ordinance 2021. A second. Right. My see. big question on this is how do you enforce this? I mean, without good. parking stickers and all the rest of it. It's going to be largely, if not entirely, complaint driven. Mm -hmm. In that somebody that, that has a waterfront lease complains that somebody's parking on their waterfront lease that shouldn't be parking there. We go out, uh, send somebody out to look at it and, and determine whether or not there is somebody parking there that should not be. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a, uh, some teeth to give to the police department if there are complaints made they're not going to be driving around to determine who's parking in the wrong place. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm confused about all of it. What is the ordinance actually stating? I mean, I know you're saying only, you're saying it's only driven by complaints. That's why we're putting this in place. It will be largely driven by complaints. It, it's, a, it's a tool for the police department to have. When somebody calls and says, hey, somebody's parking on my waterfront lease and shouldn't be. At this point right now, 
other than the lease, we really, which is a private contract between the city and the lessee, which does not apply to the third party that may be parking there, we don't really have a mechanism to deal with that. So yes, it's gonna be largely complaint driven in that somebody's gonna to have to say, okay, hey, there's somebody parking on my waterfront lease, it shouldn't be there. And, and now we have- I, And I appreciate, I appreciate that, but what, where are the boundaries? That's what I'd like to know. Where are the boundaries of where, you know, I don't, I don't know. Is it, what's a setback? Where, where can my tire be or as a, and, and, and I have no, I, I, I mean, I can fight for everything all, all day long. Can, can I pull up and, and watch, you know, the Christmas boat parade? Where does that boundary lie is what I need to know around the exterior of the island. If you are sitting in your car watching the, the boat parade, I would think it would be highly unlikely that you would receive a citation for parking on somebody else's waterfront lease because you are in your car and you can move it at that point. This deals with people that are coming out and parking uh, somewhere that they shouldn't be and there's somebody that complains about it. Does, does this open up um, the waterfront leases being considered parks in the city of Clear Lake Shores? And we have an ordinance and I don't have it in front of me, I'm sorry, that says you're not supposed to park in the parks. And I know the lease says that the leaseholder can park on their lease, but the ordinance says you can't park in the park. So are we, are we creating a Pandora's box with this? I'm throwing it out this there. This has nothing to do with the parks. This just tries to, to mirror the waterfront leases with the ordinance. No, I understand, but our waterfront leases are considered parkland, and we have ordinances that discuss parking in our parks, and the waterfront leases even though they're waterfront leases, they're still parklands in the city of Clay Lake Shores. It's city have, property, right? I'd have to follow it up, but that the waterfront parks are specifically left out of that section right now. But that was another consideration that was being brought forth was just make it no parking at all. Okay. Uh, I think this is a compromise to that, that that's been requested by several people. Okay, I understand, Kurt. Thank you. So, how does right of way play into this? Because is there a certain amount of right of way? So can people park in the right of way? Or are we saying no parking at all? The right of way is still the uh, landowner's property or the waterfront property. It is subject to the existence of the right of way. So if somebody parks in the right of way, they're still on the property of the, the waterfront. And that by this ordinance would be prohibited. Unless they are the waterfront lessee or a guest. Okay, wait a minute. So you're telling me that the lessee has leased the property from whatever bulkhead they have all the way to the concrete of the street. That's well, what you're saying. And their lease is subject to the city's right of way. And define that part. That's what I'm trying to get to. I don't know what that part is. That's going to be up to that, a surveyor. That's my question. <laughs> that's my I question. Think, that's up to a surveyor to go out there and to tell you where the city's right of way is. I don't know where it is. That's, yeah, that's one of the issues is, is as you right. go around the island, there's a datum. It, it, Right. It, 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 it becomes a variance. It's a variance. Well, correct. And so that's what I think what um, Lauren's saying is that the ROW goes with the lease, just like if you were in a house. Right. I mean, I'm getting the first, you know, it could be five feet. The front yard does not belong to me. It belongs to the city of Houston. Right. Well, I just mowed the first. Island. It can be five the feet. first five feet. That's right. The first five me feet of my yard. People park on it all the time, and that's okay. I mean, there's nothing. That's the city right of way. That's public. I think that that 
other council are talking about public parkland. That's, I want more definition. I think I need more definition. There, there's, there's a lot of, of, I mean, I get, if I had a lease, I would not want anyone doing anything on my lease, but where does that lease end? Where are the boundaries? That's what I want to know. If we're going to do a ordinance, it needs to be very specific. It needs to be detailed and it needs to say where you can and can't park. But taking any parking away on the exterior of the island for anyone, that, that takes away from all of us. My opinion. Well, That's it. It opens Pandora's box to quote Angie with parking on the island in general. <laughs> I mean, we, it, it's I think bigger than than the waterfront um, as well. But yeah, I agree. It's it's I don't know. I'm I'm not completely clear. So my question is, are we going to go around the city and say, put up signs that says no trailer parking periodically on these leases? No, that's already part of, part of the, I think it's just the, the signs would just say, you know, from this point on and then every once in a while, wherever police chief Keel feels that signs need to be placed. It would. Okay. Who wants, who wants a sign? Does anybody want signs around the Island? on the exterior i'm just saying that i'm a, i'm a resident i do not have a lease do i want anybody on my lease no no but do i want to put my golf cart up a little bit and watch the christmas boat parade or watch whatever or have a baby shower or whatever i want to have if i don't have a lease that that's that's where i'm getting i'm just wanting specifics Hey guys, I'm looking at the lease Please. itself on an exhibit A in the lease that um, we give our folks. It's it, to Jan's point, it talks about um, waterfront easement, whatever. And I'm sorry, I don't have a copy to show this to you, but it says between the shoreline of said subdivision and the adjacent right of way of shore drive as described in the certain deed. So when I'm looking at our lease, exhibit A, premises legal description, it says shoreline and adjacent right of way between those two areas. So it says here that the right of way is not included in your lease to, to Jan's point, where the heck does it stop? And it talks about the easement and how it consists of a total linear footage of whatever measured along that right of way. There you go. Yeah. But once you get to the right of way, that's owned by the city or controlled by the city, they can determine what goes in the right of way and what does not go in the right of way. So well, as, therein, therein you go. If you want to lease that part, then we're going to charge more for that part, right? I mean, I don't understand how this is going to work. And I think that's where it's going to get tricky because if somebody pulls up and they're parked in the easement right of way, whatever, lease, less, lessees are going to say, hey, you're parked in my, on my lease. But you're not. But you're not. <laughs> My, yeah. exactly. Not according to this, you're not. That, that's how I understood it as well. You're parked on the lease, which is subject to the right of way. If 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 it's actually a fee simple, then the lease is defined is defined it incorrectly. A right of way is not a, a fee simple. It, it, the right of way is essentially a roadway easement that is owned by the city. If the lease defines it as defines the 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 rights of the leaseholder as ending at the right of way, then then we need to redefine that as the fee simple ownership by the city. Either way, the city either through its police power or through its power as the owner of the fee simple interest of that land contained in what we're now calling the right of way has the authority to determine who gets to park there. Well, then does that mean leases are going to go up because we're going to charge for more square footage. I know we charge for linear feet, but you're basically what it, it, if I'm reading it correctly, 
That is eliminating any parking around the exterior of the island, period, for anything. That's how I'm reading it. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. If we want to define that as eliminating the right of way, we could certainly do that. It doesn't eliminate the parking. It, it, it'll, it would make it only for the leasers and any guests. So it but Brynn, that doesn't determine where, where's the right of way? Where's the right of way? It doesn't, I understand what you're saying. If I had a waterfront lease, dang it, I wouldn't want anybody on it, period. But where is the boundary? Where's the boundary? I can pull my golf cart up. I can park my car to, you know, have a have around the perimeter. Where is the boundary is my question. Lauren, that, that I mean, Mr. Smith, that's a good question for you. That that is that is up to you guys as the policymakers. Where are you gonna put that? Right now, I'm telling you that you can define it. Uh, you, you can uh, stop parking in the right of way. You can stop parking other than lessees and their guests on the waterfront. That's up to you guys as the policymakers. So I have a question. So say I have a waterfront, I park my car on it, my guest parks their golf cart, and that five foot easement that the city has somebody else can park there with no problem is that an option it's not necessarily five feet but, but i'm just saying if yes that would be an option and that's what we're trying to take away trying to I believe or trying to change for people to access the lease. an ordinance that allows the police to enforce something that there's nothing right now <sighs> Basically, if somebody pulls up onto somebody's waterfront lease and parks their car and gets out of it, we want to give the police some teeth to be able to deal with that. I mean, Mr. Smith, do we want our police dealing with that? If someone, look, I don't have a waterfront lease. Do but I go, do I is, want to watch the boat parade? Of course I do. Am I That's going to damage anybody's property? No, absolutely I'm not, not. I am not advocating this ordinance. Okay. This I ordinance is suggested to you as the policymakers. I draft the ordinances that are requested to be drafted. Thank Whether you. or not you adopt them, that's up to y'all. It's no different really well i mean right now if somebody pulls up and parks in my right of way i can't do anything about it or in the right of way in my backyard as we know we can't do anything about it and so now we're now we're i feel like we're making different rules for the waterfront than what we have for the rest of of the interior streets um throughout the island so i mean i think if we're going to say right of way is right of way then this ordinance needs to be changed to reflect that people can still park in the right of way it's city right of way the the city has always had control over its right of ways they, they own them they can determine what goes in the right of ways what stays out of the right of way but there's nothing about this ordinance that's changing that Well, actually, actually, it does, Lauren, because it says, I was reading the, the document, it, 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 it says waterfront lot. That it, It's not even defined. What does that mean, waterfront lot? So that, that needs to be defined. The, the parameters need to be defined. It needs to be very specific. So no one can, you know, not understand where they can pull up, where they can't pull up, all of that kind of stuff, because it's going to get into a thing. Here, here's what I'm foreseeing, and I don't know, because we're trying to make policy for the long run, okay? So what that means is if we prohibit any parking around the exterior of the island, that means they're going to be parking on the interior, okay? Everything's going to be pushed on the interior, which will affect every citizen 
on the interior of the island. So you're going to have people park in all inside. Everybody's going to be fussing about right of way everywhere. So, so that's, that's where I'm going with this. If it, if it's going to happen, please make it specific. Please make it where nobody can fuss about where the boundaries are. That's all I'm asking. Hey, Jan, do you have any recommendations or, you know, that we could take, go offline and help, help, help this? Well, I don't know. I mean, s something that you can consider is like what two tires on the pavement. I don't know. I understand that people put big money into waterfront lots. I understand that. Would I want anybody on, you know, running around and doing damaging what I'm trying to maintain? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I just feel like maybe we could put something together and I don't know. I, I, I know Angie and we did a little committee a long time ago about, you know, the boat ramp. We were talking about that. I don't know if that should happen. I, something, I mean, if we need to move forward on this, I think we really need to define all the boundaries and, and everybody needs to get on board with it. I mean, I'm behind whatever everyone comes up with. I think we need to hear everyone out is my, yeah, is my point. Of, uh, research on this in the 1982, you know, Mike Bass worked a lot on this and I think there was like 14 to 20 issues or concerns and, and two of them that are, and I can't remember the second one, but the, one of them is parking and it implicitly states that the leaseholder can park on their lease. Now this is in the lease exhibit, right? Up to 48 right. hours per week. And then, you know, how do you even govern that? And then, you know, basically like Mr. Smith saying is that you would, you know, it's governed off of complaints, you know, and no boat trailers are allowed to be parked out there either and stuff. And so there used to be a requirement that the numbers face the road and, and just trying to talk to a lot of the folks that have been around here and stuff. And, and, you know, you could look up the numbers and see that somebody's parked and somebody would complain. I don't, I don't think that that, that this is going to that level where you're going around and, and trying to ticket people and where they're parked and marking tires with chalk like they do in New York City. But on the other side of it, there has been a lot of complaints that leaseholders have had people parking on their parking spots and they've asked for the, the lease and, and or the ordinance to be changed to clarify this. And that's what, you know, the, the city staff went off and worked. Now we can certainly, uh, I am simply operating off of direction from city staff. Right. If there's a, a direction uh, that needs to go a different way, I am happy to uh, to go that direction. Certainly. We're that, not having people be able to tackle any feathers. Yeah, I mean, my thought is I'm all for not. I mean, people not like pulling all the way to the waterfront and parking on your lease, like we've seen happen. I, I totally get that. My concern, Jan, kind of I think along the lines is leave a right of way open. So I don't know how to define that in here. Is it instead of saying waterfront lots, do you say? We can, we can say waterfront lot other than the right, the, other than the right of way or something. I mean, Jan. They, they have to be a hundred percent on the water, waterfront lot. Yeah. And, and the existing waterfront lease, you know, it allows for a placement of monuments um, six feet from the road edge. The problem with the right of, right of way and trying to define that is it's different all around the island. Yeah. There's a straight line drawn every right, yes, feet. and that as the as the curvature of the road goes around, that right of way could be 20 feet. That right of way because it's 30 feet to each side. It could yeah, be it, it could be five feet. So yeah, maybe, and honestly, there there are bulkheads that are so close to the road. I totally get that. I totally get that. So, but everything needs to be uniform. If we're going to make some rules, let's make some rules based on uniformity, specificity, you know, and, and, and what, if we're going to ask our law enforcement officers to regulate this, that, I mean, they need to have some, they need to have some kind of direction. I mean, it doesn't need to be ambiguous in any way, shape, or form. Jan, I agree with what you're saying. I think the challenge comes in, and, and Kevin or Kirk, correct me, with the engineering stuff, 
since we don't have a uniform right of way throughout the island, how do you even specify waterfront lot versus right of way? Because it sounds like we all want the same thing. We don't want people parking on other people's lot waterfront, but we do want to allow parking on the right of way. But how big is the right of way? It depends on where you are. And nobody knows that. And to Jan's point, the police can't enforce that because they don't know what it is either. So I don't know if there's any way to get uniform and specific when it comes to the island's right of way. Elise said you can't put something six feet from the pavement. Then is it six feet? I mean, is that enough to park a car? I don't, I, I don't know yeah, how light. parallel to the road and the police have the judgment on whether it uh, disrupts the traffic flow or emergency access of the vehicles. So in looking at the lease agreement, it does say six feet. You can put planter box, you can put, you know, your rock or whatever. So is that how it, is that how we look I, at it? I don't I know. I think that was the intent of the original lease when they did them now. And I'm gonna take you back in a little bit of time too, just real quickly to, to make sure everybody understands the whole purpose of the leases is there was all just riffraff around the island. If it wasn't for the, 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 the money from the residents that they went ahead and t took over these leases, they had to put bulkheads in and, and millions and millions of dollars were spent. And that's been, it, it been in place for 30 or 40, 40 years. And, and the city has enforced that if you have a lease, you have to maintain them. And everybody's aware that you don't maintain them, that the city takes them back and they sell and they're, they're worth a lot of money. Um, but at the same time, those residents have, that have leases have maintained those um, bulkheads over time. So that's another million, million dollars. And so myself and Brent, you know, we were just thinking about, you know, if the city was to take over all the leases, I mean, how much money is that? It's, it's 20, $30 million. So from a cost standpoint from the city, that's something that we definitely don't want to assume. So we, we, we got to keep the, the leaseholders and all that stuff with the, what's intended in the leaseholder agreement uh, there. Well, those agreements are already in place. I can't imagine anyone, you know, they're in place. Uh, so my next question is, how long are those leases in place for our contractual, you know, agreements with everyone on the island? I'm not sure. That's Ten a good years. question. I'm, I'm, Ten years. When, when are the leases up? Like the, the contractual agreements? Ten, 10 years, Jan. I believe it's in 2023. The last time the lease was modified was 2013. So like Lauren said, 2023 is the next time they'll be able to be modified and they last for 10 years. So can we, can we say that the leasee and guests can park on the body of their water lease and then the six foot to the road would be open parking. That way, Mr. Smith to come up with that wording. Both yeah, parties. We can, change, we can change the wording to that to that effect that they have to be wholly on the uh, the the waterfront to be in violation of this ordinance. So long as as you've got uh, uh, adequate room for uh, vehicles and emergency vehicles to pass, if there are people parked on both sides of the right of way. So that, that would allow people to park around the island still, but then the leaseholders will have access to their leases. And Kurt, does that take care of the complaints that we're hearing from the leaseholders? If, if they were still having people park on that right of way, not their lease body, would that I, satisfy what yeah. their problems are? I'm sorry. I, I, I believe so. The only thing is, you know, if you have four cars parked on the edge and God forbid they don't want to move so you can have access to your lease. Um, but I think everybody can work through that. The, the, this just makes it a, so much better for the leaseholders, but yeah. also still provides parking around. Yeah. What it does is provide a tool for the police to be able to deal with situations where people are parked in or, or you know, or there's people that are part, that are using somebody's waterfront lease that should not be. Yeah, right, right now the police have been involved. I mean, I can count probably on you know, two handfuls of, of situations where it's just a big, huge gray area and, and they have nothing to go on. So it's a, a big waste of time for both the leaseholders, homeowners, residents, and, and police trying to uh, argue this. And the police are not going to be involved in actively going around and measuring cars and confirming identities and, and all of that. 
at the very beginning of the discussion said it was complaint driven it would be complaint driven by a leaseholder who doesn't recognize a vehicle and it doesn't stop friends so forth uh, guests from parking there and uh, trying to give a little bit of clarification there So can we give direction then to, to clarify this lease body and right of way are two different things. However, legally you say that to kind of make everybody happy, allow parking and not get. I, I believe that I have the direction that the uh, no parking should be on the, the waterfront lease itself, not in the right of way. Yes. Yes, sir. That's that. Do you want to amend your motion or do you want to make a new motion or something since I think we have the to do motion, this. motion was to discuss, wasn't it? It was. Okay, I think. So I, I believe it could be a motion to make that change and then with that change um, release it or do like we did the last STR and for you to work it and come back at the first meeting. We, we, we'll, we, will, we will rework it and bring it back to you so that you can see the language and, our, and can approve of it. A clarification of it, yeah. of the parking. Excuse me. A clarification of the parking of the leased waterfront property. I'm not understanding what you're asking. I'm just saying that it seems like there's a discussion over who can park on leased properties and where they are. And so that needs to be clarified over or what is lease property and what is public parking properly. Correct. Thank you. That, that was Amanda Bauer. Yes. I always forget all the rules. I'll just state your name. <laughs> Sorry, and I actually go by Mandy, but I don't know how to change my thing. Ah, I can change it. <laughs> All right, any further discussion? I, I, I guess I need a motion to, to do that. Is it open? I'm sorry, is it open for public discussion yet? I missed. Yes. I, I just have a quick, I mean, Who is I've this? listened to, I'm sorry, this is Collie Hagen. Um, I mean, I completely understand um, not wanting anybody to park on their, their lease and stuff, but I think What's something. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I'm on Oak Street. Okay. Address. Two twenty one Oak. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um. And I completely understand not you know not wanting anybody to park on their lease and so on and so forth. And I also understand the right of way. But something you do need to take into consideration is if you allow people to park on the right of way, which is fine, they need to allow access. They need to not block it completely to where people can't get to their lease, to their lot. And like on ours, we only have 13 linear feet. So if somebody parks parallel on the right of way on just our lot, we no longer have access to our lease without going on somebody else's to get to it. Right. So that's, one, that, that's one of the things that we will define in the, the revised ordinance. Okay, so you'll make a stipulation as to not to block the entire access to the lease. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to add to that, and it, that just struck another memory cell that I had, is that on the east shore, there was a big concern with all the boat trailers parking along the edge. And so folks wanted that address. And I want to make sure that council with their decision to allow parking on the edge would allow boat trailers to be parked along that edge. So all those those folks there that have been complaining about that to city staff and myself and maybe others, um, that would not resolve that. Okay, herein lies, how long do you allow them to park there? So do we get into a time frame, or do we get into, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. Do you get into a time frame? It, 
right now there's no, I don't know what the ordinance is, Chief Keel, on, on how long you can stay parked. 48 hours. That's in it's 48 the, hours. Is it 48 hours? Okay. No, Kurt, you're absolutely right. I'm thinking about, I don't care where the trailers park. It's not my thing here on East Shore, but you're right. My neighbors are very um, adamant about that trailer parking on the right of way thing. And you're right, this doesn't address that. And I had forgotten about that. So good point. So, so an option is, I mean, city council has a right to do this and, and chief Keel has a right on um, the way the ordinance is written now. And, and Mr. Smith can, can second this, but uh, the way it's written now is, is Chief Keel based on, on the needs and, and keeping the streets uh, um, accessible, that you could, you could do no parking through that curve there. I know that we've done that in the past. Y'all had a committee, we took them down, we tried to get rid of all the, the sign pollution, including uh, allowing uh, regular vehicles to park inside of uh, Shell Bottom Park. But um, you know, that's something that a, a council member can bring back, or you can ask staff to bring back a separate one for addressing starting, say, at the at Shell Bottom Park and going, I don't know, 200 feet. There would be no, no boat trailer parking along that edge. Um, that's all I, I have to throw out there at you. Per to what you're saying, I think, I think we can look at all the options. You know all the items you know time frame where how when when and i think that would be good to address that so we're going to go back to putting signs up everywhere to have all that information on there is that what you're saying jan no i did not say that no no everyone was talking about Okay, so we're talking about two different animals. We're talking about the boat ramp, and then we're talking about the exterior of the island. I'm just throwing out there, I think we need more information, more, you know, talking about how everything can be resolved, but I know it needs to be specific. That's all. Thomas wanted to speak, Kurt, can't hear him. No, um, so anybody just, uh, any further discussion, we need a motion. Need a motion to do something with the item. As I understand, we're motioning about parking and other people's properties. Well, there's there's no further discussion right now. It's it's got a motion in front of the council. So we have to revise the motion to send Lauren back to make it more specific. Is that is that what we need? Yeah, the previous motion was just to discuss. Okay. It's a motion to send it back or table. That's it. Well, I think he said he had some clear direction as to what he understood that we wanted. I feel like I have an understanding correct. Okay. All right, so I'll throw this out. All right, I'll make a motion um, for ordinance 2020-21 to go back to legal to clarify the details regarding where parking is allowed and when. On um, waterfront leases. On waterfront leases, thank you. Correct. Who's second? Amanda. Okay, motion by Angie and second by Amanda. I'm sorry, public doesn't vote. <laughs> hey, being public. It's just council. <laughs> I'll be there soon enough. Thank you for raising your hand, though. All right. All in favor is aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Nay. Having no nays, all ayes. Motion passed unanimously. It'll go back to uh, 
council or back to legal and, and bring it back to the first meeting. All right. Next is uh, item G uh, to approach TxDOT regarding changes to FM 2094 in light of recent construction on South Highway uh, 146 and Birch Road Bridge and City Administrator Brent Spear. Hello, uh, hopefully this is an easier one to attack. Uh, I wanted to uh, put this on the agenda to get direction from uh, direction and or consensus from council to see if they would like to approach TxDOT in light of construction at 146 and the Birch Road Bridge being uh, under construction. We've got increased pedestrian traffic uh, with the kids going to school. Um, there's more cars that are uh, going out the front entrance and down 2094. And with the construction, uh, you know, there are other considerations and people are looking at stuff. And my concern is uh, safety of students and um, residents and visitors to the area. Would it make sense to approach TxDOT to see if they would consider making a change in the miles per hour just to slow traffic in that area to allow for um, maybe greater visibility, any potential hazards. Um, it makes me nervous to see see the traffic and see the kids on the sidewalk right next to the road. And I've witnessed it a couple times, a uh, kid in the morning and, and again in the afternoon on a bicycle. And he's, he's properly outfitted and, and he's, he's good on his bicycle, but he's still right there next to the road riding um, against him with traffic. So. Um, that was a consideration. So I don't know if uh, council would like for me to do, to do that. I can draft a letter and uh, have it signed by council and mayor myself and send it to them requesting that. Brent, do you know if we can do that for a, a, a I'm understanding that you want it temporarily while the bridge is out but do you know if that's a thing can we do a temporary speed reduction is that that's we a can, thing we can. i mean they text dot right it's text dot road but you don't know unless you ask so i just okay i think, I think there's it, more, more direction to help with brent making a decision you know if council didn't want to do this then i'm not going to go out there and ask him. we wouldn't exert the time so i think we just wanted or Brent wanted the council's opinion that's whether he should go off and work this or not. Understand, Kurt. Thank you. I am I am fully in support of that. Yes. Also, just at the end of the day, it would not be an ordinance change to Clear Lake Shores. It would be text dot change in that speed limit. If if it's possible and doable, but it also would get uh, the city on record as to their concerns regarding that. So I'll motion for Brent to approach TxDOT um, regarding changes to FM 2094 in light of recent construction on Highway 146 and Birch Road Bridge. I'll second. Jan Bailey, second. All right, I have a motion by Amanda, second by Councilwoman Jan Bailey. Any discussion? Public? Having none, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Having no nays, all ayes. Motion passes unanimously. All right, item H, executive session, pursuant to section 551.074 concerning personnel matters. It authorizes certain deliberation about officers and employees of the governmental body to be held in executive session one, to deliberate the appointment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of public officer employee, city administrator Brent Spear, chief of police Tracy Keel, and city secretary Christy Strop. Item I, also going into exec executive session, pursuant of section 551.72 authorizes a governmental body to deliberate an exec executive session on certain matters concerning real property a governmental body may conduct a closed meeting to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value, value of real property if deliberation in an open meeting would have detrimental effect on the position of the governmental body in negotiations with a third person. 
So at this time, we will be actually uh, closing this meeting down um, to go into executive Mayor, session. Mayor, can you state the time for the record? Oh, I will. I'll, I'll get to that. Um, my, my apologies. Yeah, sorry. Um, so we'll be going to executive session and then we'll be opening this meeting back up. Um, if you if you would like to know that um, um, when we reconvene this meeting, I can give you my phone number and you can text me and say, I would like to be invited. Uh, my phone number is 832-584-0975. Again, 832-584-0975. And we will be going into recess at 858.